to kick off the program. Each artist is going to discuss a bit about their artwork. And then we will be moderating a, moderating a discussion. If there's time at the end, we will also have a Q&A from participants. Uh, so to begin, I'd like to welcome Marcus and Margarita. Thank you, Natalie. Um, so I'm Margarita Benitez. I'm a professor at Kent State University. I'm also the fashion technologist there. This is Marcus. I'm Marcus Vogel. I'm at the University of Akron, the Myers School of Art. Um, and I also run the makerspace there, um, which is called the MLab. So we've been collaborating since uh, about the year 2000. And our studio, this. are you sharing? Not yet. Okay. Hang on. One second. We will share this with you. We have a little uh, presentation here. You should, you should be seeing this now. And um, yeah. there so we are. Yeah, so that's where our practice uh, kind of is in between design, art, making, technology. And we have interdisciplinary backgrounds. So when we started working with technology and collaborating, um, there was no Arduino. Uh, there was something called basic stamp. And um, we'll show you the next slide, I think is, is it? well, this is one of the further ones, but uh, basically what we actually did was we actually pursued further education in order to, to become more acclimated with the technology because we knew we wanted to continue working with technology. So I got an MFA from the School of the Art Institute and Marcus got an MFA from Donau University Krems. And both of those were in, in basically new media art, which was in interaction. And so what Margarita referenced is, is a piece of technology that you might or might not have heard of, but so that dates back to like probably the early 2000s when we did our first piece. And I'm gonna skip this slide here for a second. And that was actually that piece called ADAS, Algorithmic Data Arrangement Synchronous, which is essentially a piece when you slide your driver's license, it interprets the data on your driver's license in sound. And then you can listen to it through those glass speakers. At the same time, it would also print it out on a dot matrix printer, which really kind of freaked people out um, because then all of a sudden they realized that there was actually data on their driver's license. Um, and so that was uh, the year 2000. Yeah, that was a while ago. So after doing this and seeing how people would interact, it really made us aware that we wanted to continue doing this kind of work. That's when we thought uh, extra education. So I guess go to back to the. So to, to our, to our mind, and this is something that we actually in our pre-panel meeting spoke about as well, is especially with interaction work, it's just incredibly important that the spectator adds his own contribution. So the technology itself can really never or should never overpower the artwork, the narrative, the research, right? So it is first and foremost, we are in the, in the, in the, um, in sort of the, uh, the, the business of actually delivering an entire, um, an entire, I'm my skipping the word, an entire experience actually. So we are not necessarily in sort of the rendering business of like 2D or 3D, but we want to deliver an experience. And that is the first piece that yeah. has such a thing. Yeah, so we developed um, some software to run on iPods, uh, iPod touches and mini projectors, and it used dancers. Uh, to create this interactive dance installation where the dancers had also wearable light up colors that um, both reacted to the movements and, and the dancer. Um, so the dancer was kind of like the gatekeeper of the audio and the visuals for this piece. So that that was kind of nice. We got an NEA uh, grant for this. Yeah. In like 2013. So the interesting part about this piece actually is that it is or was an app. So it, it went, uh, it was written as an app that could also be downloaded, but it was specifically created as a performance piece that was a wearable and then had the cowl that was also um, reactive. Um, and then over time, as we have not performed this piece anymore, it does no longer actually uh, exist within uh, App Store. Yeah, and this this is also another interactive piece. And both Sarah and this piece were part of Ingenuity Fest, and Emily will talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but this one worked with Twitter, 
And as um, it counted how many times people would tweet Ingenuity Fest during Ingenuity Fest, and it would light up these hearts and create animation. So there's, there's quite a bit you can do with technology and create different types of interactions with people. Um, this is another one we did, which is sound-based installation, where you play the game of billiards and depending on the, the two uh, teams, um, whoever was playing, like it would create a sonification again. Based on the traveling of oh. the, uh, based on the traveling of the balls. Um, the versus series that we have is generally a series that interprets technologically sort of the, the, the the participation of a team, as Margarita mentioned, and in this case, these are Super Bowls, the interpretation of Super Bowls as 3D printed pieces. So as we kind of went away from interactive technology, uh, we wanted to go back into 3D printing, which uh, our first 3D print was like in 98, 1998 yeah, or something. Anyways, maybe this is a good place to stop. So basically, um, we went from interaction that the the crux with interaction is the fact that you're kind of giving the power away to the people that are interacting with the work. So sometimes you'll get things that um, are within what you thought was gonna happen and other things people do and you're like, oh my God, why are they doing that kind of thing? So you give away quite a bit of power when you work with technology and um, interactivity. And this kind of led us in our, this piece led us to our most current work, which is um, 3D printing animal enrichments and habitats, which you can see at back nature preserve and we can talk more about this yeah later. we're just uh, going through the, the the slides here a little bit so these are 3d printed the spider actually lives in this 3d printed um um basically outdoor sculpture so we've decided to work with animals rather than right. interact with people <laughs> yes yeah we went away from people to animals this is a turtle platform this is a uh, 3d printed bee waterer um, these are chimney swift towers that are actually also in Bath Nature Preserve. This is large scales so of these are like 10 feet. It's done in with CNC and digital fabrication. I can't really talk about this all day long. Um, they light up at night uh, and basically they're big birdhouses. And then our latest work is in the which is which was actually launched at Summit Art Space in like 2015, but there has been many iterations. It's essentially 3D printed exoskeletons that leave imprints on skin. Um, and so this is sort of a, a, a sort of snake skin. And then we're also having um, this, the latest versions. And then this is essentially we cup uh, patterns on people. And that is also our last slide. You want to get a hold of us? Here's our information. Sorry, we didn't mean to run over time. I think we were given five minutes, so we're a little bit over. You're great. Thank you so much, Margarita and Marcus, for uh, sharing your story. Um, we will be hearing from Gary next. Hello, everybody. I'm Gary Galbraith, um, and I'm going to try and share a screen here. My turn. OK, I think we all can see that. Um, I am Gary Galbraith, professor of dance here at Case Western Reserve University. And um, I serve as the artistic director of the dance department here at the university as well, too. Um, so let me see if I can get control of my. OK, there we go. Um, now, just I just want to go a quick background because not to bore you with my personal story, but rather to give you context and perspective on the, the orientation. I've been dancing professionally. I'd spent a good chunk of my time um, you know, dancing professionally, but most of it was with Martha Graham, who that name may mean something to some of you, but if not, she was she was a, a force to be reckoned with. Um, but that being said, then it's like my, my work in dance and technology is oriented from dance as a performing art. And that's been a real key thing for me. Um, and I've been using that extensively here at the university for the last um, uh, well, 20, 20 some odd years here, but real quick then this is, you know, not to, this is not meant to be a lecture, but just for like context here, you know, when we, one of the things that I find helpful here is that when we talk about dance and technology, what are we talking about? Because when I went back to do some research, I found that, of course, if anybody who's involved in dance, it's like we can go all the way back to late, you know, to the 19th century, where we had artists working with dance and technology. So, you know, this, this fabulous choreographer, um, Lily Polar, she was working with some really high-end new technology of the time, and that was called the electric light. Um, no one had ever done anything like that, and especially when you had some color, it was revolutionary. Martha Graham herself used um, 
uh, discovered, you know, these new weaving techniques. Uh, when she didn't do it, but she made use of when they discovered stretched jersey. You know, this was a new technology. So the thing is that, and then Alwyn Nikolai and Cunningham, they, you know, these are all different examples of people that went on to do things. So when we're talking about technology, you know, and uh, especially dance and technology, I think we have to be mindful of what are we talking about because it's really nothing new. It's really, but when we're talking about the digital side of things, that's where I think a lot of the options have come forward. And that's really what I wanted to focus on right now. Um, so the orientation, as I mentioned, is on the dance as a live performance. You know, there can be dance for camera or social media, or even these efforts of what I call human replacement. You know, people using, you know, doing all this motion capture to create avatars. It's like, what's the matter? In my opinion, it's like, what's the matter with the human? I mean, I, that's our robotics. I mean, I, I don't know, that's just me. Um, you know, and it has been shared by Marcus um, and um, um, his colleague, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, Marguerite, thank you. Um, you know, the, the idea of technology to serve the art, and I think that's really important here. And um, those things are important to me as well, too. There's a couple of examples I just want to show you um, in this category of things that I've done. Um, real quick here. Uh, the first ones were um, what I call network technologies. This is a, 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 a combination of works that I had done. These were early on, these are 20 some odd years ago. Um, Kasumi, who's also part of this panel, she and I collaborated on several projects. So she and I go way back, but she and I worked on Kinetic Shadows back in 2002. So that's a little over 20 years that she and I have done that. And it was really groundbreaking at the time, but it's funny because when you look at it now, it's kind of like, you know, the fact we're all sitting here on a Zoom, it's like a no brainer. We're talking about a time when this was before Skype. So the idea of network technologies, the idea of dancers in different locations and media being transported and combined and all that was relatively new, but that's something that was really informative for me. We, um, and in Common Space, which was a year, a couple, several years later, that was a tri-city um, effort. And again, we're focusing mainly on these high-speed network technologies. Obviously, those technologies have been dwarfed over the years with what we currently have today. We moved on to what I use, uh, developed um, and started in, in integrating different kinds of software performance tools in that. And again, these were some projects that I did with Kasumi as well, too. And these were... Uh, um, live dances, these are dances where these things are being integrated live into the performing experience. Again, that's a key thing for me um, is in the live experience in the, in the theater. Um, I moved on to a series of works. And again, these are just two of each of the categories. There's many other works in each of these categories where I started experimenting with uh, responsive media. And that being that the dancers um, were, used, were able to control a lot of the media um, at the time, and that was using, in, I used infrared um, uh, technologies, I mean, and pretty simple and straightforward, not too difficult to do, but uh, lots of limitations, but it's at least started me on that path of that, of that work. Um, I'm going to skip on some of the examples because I think people would rather talk and not watch. So I'm going to jump on to the next one here, and that's the next set of uh, works are holographic and that I started in integrating holographic content on stage in, in live real time type of thing here. Uh, the early ones were, I guess, well, back in 2011 with a different kind of holographic tech, uh, technology. And then several years later then, um, I did one partnering with Microsoft on a very large project <clears throat> with some other colleagues here at the university. And that one turned out to be exceptionally um, successful on that one. And again, I'll skip the demo on that one as well, too. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the, rate, the latest projects I've been working on, I've been utilizing a new set of technologies, and that is uh, LIDAR. And um, we know what sonar and radar are, but LIDAR uses infrared laser. And it's the same technology that's used in self-driving cars and robotics and all that. And I figured it's like, well, if this technology can be used for navigation and, the, and the collision avoidance, why can't we watch dancers with this technology? And so then finding the right company, I've been able to build systems that allow me to do a heck of a lot more on stage with this three-dimensional data set streaming in during performance, and then I can do a lot more with that. So that's been very um, a, a branch of some new things that I'm very excited about. And again, I'll skip the demo for now. 
Um, moving on, it's like what's next for me? I think it's going to be, I'm curious to see how we can start utilizing this LIDAR, this location. It's not motion tracking, it's more like uh, location tracking. Um, also working with some colleagues on this, a new generation of holographic work, meaning that projecting holographic content on the stage. Um, I've got students that are interested in integrating AI into some location data, but I'm still debating on like, well, what do you mean a, you know, machine learning and location data? It's like, that's called choreography. You know, it's like a choreographer comes up with that. Why do we need a machine to do that? So it's, it's bringing up some ethical questions, which I think is sort of interesting, but at least I've got students at least starting to ask questions, which I think is super important. And I've got some other grad students who are looking at costuming technology, which I think is going to be very exciting as far as um, other branches uh, coming forward here. So, uh, yeah, that's my little spiel. Hopefully I did that in the five minutes that I got. Thanks so much, Gary, for sharing about what you've been up to. Um, next, we have Kasumi. And I just got a little intro from Gary from, yeah. I actually forgot a couple of those pieces we had done. That was so much fun. And we were really exploring kind of new and exciting ways to present live performance that, and I, I did learn a lot from collaborating with Gary. Um, and that led me to, well, I going back in my life, the reason I have, I guess I have found myself using a lot of technology in my work is I started out as a musician. And so the idea of time-based work was always, you know, part of my life. Um, and I've veered towards different, are you gonna play the samples or the, the, the things that I provided? Cause that would help, you know, kind of illustrate my talking. Okay, so this is, um, is that a motion or is it just, here we go. And you can turn the sound off if you want to do that. So um, I'm always, I'm interested in sound. Sound off. Oh, but it won't. Can you play it without having the sound on? Okay. So a lot of the, this is a, um, uh, gallery um, exhibit I did at the Sculpture Center just recently, and it deals with movement and the meaning behind movement um, and what happens, it's kind of low res uh, what happens when you multiply these movements and stagger the movements, you know, that, that sort of thing. But this is all um, kind of a continuation of my work in time-based media um, and the explorations I, I've done since I was a musician. This is a piece at the uh, Rocket Mortgage Field House. It's also not playing too well. And again, I use the motion, just random movements of the players, of the bas basketball players, and made patterns and created these illusions, you know, from just from very tiny gestures. Um, now, you know, when you talk about incorporating technology into your work, in my, because I don't, I never had like a focus of college or, you know, because I'm autodidact. Um, my work had developed piece by piece, project base. So when I would find a project that I was interested in working on or a mission that I wanted to accomplish, something that I wanted to do, I would try to find what is the technology I need in order to make that work and not the other way around. Although if, I, if there is a new technology, I really wanna try it and I'll, I'll see what it's capable of and then put that in the drawer for later on and, and see if that will somehow help me continue my work. This piece is a glitched image. So I use technology in a kind of destructive way to take an image and glitch it, color and image um, to come up with new, you know, new ways of seeing things. 
Uh, recently, I don't know what other images we have here. I'm sorry, I'm so disorganized. It's another glitch. This is a fun use of technology. But again, project based. This was um, at the museum. This was one of the summer solstice. Um, I think it was from 2011. I think it was a while back. And I projected on, you know, on the facade, as you can see. But each, with each piece, I have to learn a new technology. Shockwaves is a feature length film that was funded by the Guggenheim Foundation. It has over 25,000 different shots in it. And so that, that forced me to figure out new technologies, new, how to use the tools that I had and new tools that I, I didn't even know about to create this piece. Um, recently, I'm playing around with augmented reality. Oh, there's Chris Bells. Augmented reality and um, artificial intelligence. And the jury is out. I mean, the one thing I wanna say about artificial intelligence, AI, is that if unless you have access to enormous data sets, you aren't gonna, you, your results are gonna kind of look like the other guys. I don't know if, if anyone has, you know, listening has um, played around with some of the apps that are available for AI and they all kind of start to look alike. So this is going back a little bit. This is an app I developed called Shufflehead and all of this is on my website, kasumifilms.com. And this is an app that you can create hundreds of thousands of different images by spinning. You can see that little, the middle image is like spinning blocks. Each image is an octagon divided into three parts. And then you can spin and make new images and color them. And it has music that you can create. And it has a text um, option that you can create like little poems and things. So that's Shufflehead. So that's sort of what, you know, how I've been using technology for my work in the last 20 years, starting with Gary. I was so, when, when they called and said, here, this is the project we want to do. And um, Tom Nab, who was the chief engineer, um, called and tried to describe the project. And it was like, what? And now we're doing like, the same thing just with Zoom. Anyway. Thanks so much, Kasumi, for sharing that. And it was great to have your videos be a part of it as well. Um, and last but not least, we have Emily. Hey, guys. I love that on this panel of art and technology, every single one of us has started with, let me try to get uh, my screen shared. Um, so it seems that I have done it. Um, for something a little bit different, you know, I grew up never thinking of myself as somebody who was interested in technology. My first job was on a goat farm. Um, I grew up in creeks catching tadpoles. I was very interested in, um, what at the time I didn't see as, uh, technological pursuits at all. I was, you know, um, a carpenter and, um, you know, a little bit of a Luddite. Um, and I took my love of carpentry and um, set building stage design. I had, you know, my early work uh, uh, was with Great Lakes Theater Festival and building props and all kinds of stuff. And I um, took that thinking that I would um, become an architect and I was lucky enough to head to the Yale School of Architecture, <clears throat> Texture, excuse me. And, you know, the very first thing that I saw and encountered there, which was tremendous to be introduced to was, you know, all of that. This was really at the moment of maker culture becoming truly accessible and kind of make magazine at its high point and a 3D printer on every desktop and robots and laser cutters um, and all of this great stuff. But at the same time, 
kind of feeling like being in studio all day and you know, the plethora of 3D modeling tools and Revit and Rhino and everything that everybody was using, um, it it started to feel very frantic to me and almost like, you know, very similar in the kinds of work that was being produced and the pace and everything. Um, suffice it to say, I spent a lot more time um, not in studio and kind of exploring other ways to, um, other ways to to uh, satisfy my curiosity about people and cities and shared space and organizing space around you. Um, and that looked like spending a lot of time up at the Yale Sustainable Food Project, um, where I learned about farming and natural building. Um, I spent a lot of time in the Beinecke Rare Books Museum, where I spent a lot of time um, sneezing on thousand year old uh, illuminated manuscripts. Um, and of course, as you guys know, this is where I started to um, integrate my understanding of, just as all of my co-panelists have said before me, that technology is not just about the newest, latest, and greatest. A book is a technology. The printing press is the tech, you know, is a technology. Um, spent a lot of time at the Yale School of Forestry learning about uh, the technologies associated with. Um, organizing our natural world and uh, learning from people like um, James C. Scott about, you know, how in Russia, the, the practice of scientific farming, where people thought they had really figured out how a forest worked and, um, you know, planted trees in rows and, and thought they were going to make um, uh, such productive forests and all of a sudden because that natural chaos that had evolved of roots and rhizomes and messiness of of trees growing up and falling down and rotting um all of a sudden you know that new technology of forestry um was found to be ineffective and forests were dying um in 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 years uh uh in a matter of years instead of existing for centuries um, met another tremendous professor there um, named Stephen Kellert, who, who took uh, the concept of biophilic. Uh, biophilia was, was a term coined by uh, an ant scientist named E.O. Wilson. Some of you might have heard of or read about him, um, uh, but really expanded that idea of what is biophilic into architecture and actually discovered that uh, wrote about, theorized um, about how new architecture, new technology and architecture, modern architecture um, and postmodern architecture, um, these are not necessarily um, fulfilling to, to the human animal um, and what is actually um, much more filling to the human animal is certain forms, whether they look like uh, this, you know, a form that's very clearly borrowing from nature, uh, where you have um, bamboo and it looks very forest-like, or even a form that is built with new technology in architecture, but still has some of the things that the human animal evolved with, that sense of prospect and um, uh, refuge where you're, where you're, uh, I should say prospect and refuge where you're, where you're, uh, able to look out into a broad expanse, but also be kind of tucked away. Um, you know, and that's a form that's been found in architecture all throughout history, all the way back to ancient Greek and Roman colonnades. Um, but this newer concept that that, the reason that that is so satisfying to humans is because, um, we evolved, right, to be little creatures on the edge of a forest, wanting to be all tucked away, but looking out. Um, so these all were some of the different ways that I started to think about how to access types of technology that doesn't necessarily look like and feel like being in the studio with the robots and the 3D modeling software spitting out renderings that all of my co-panelists I know have talked about, um, you know, with art and technology that that um, 
need to be careful that you are not a slave to the technology, that your technology isn't overpowering your artwork. Very, very easy to do with some of the tools that we have now. Um, so for me, my journey was much more about discovering older tools or um, traditional tools, traditional technologies, um, ancient manufacturing, ancient building, um, spent a lot of time out west after school, building with mud and straw, and, um, and then even blending newer technologies. You can see here um, some beautiful metalwork that was all cut out and designed with um, pl uh, plasma cutters, CNC-aided plasma cutter uh, design, all drafted on a computer, but goes back to that biophilic design thing where this is you know, hearkening back to forests or to um, uh, medieval and Gothic architecture. Um, got very involved in a lot of big industrial art spaces out West um, and was instrumental in those spaces as, as an organizer, places where we were very much um, modeling that marriage of traditional techniques, uh, tra uh, traditional manufacturing and industrial techniques. We um, had some amazing shop spaces that we worked out of, but um, bringing in some very new thinking, this project, um, uh, was a huge collaboration, Crude Awakening, um, went to Burning Man and, and uh, a number of other places besides um, all kind of about the end of an oil era. Um, uh, too many interesting things to kind of dig into other than to say, um, was happy to find uh, places where forward thinking could mix with um, these much more kind of tactile, big, loud, dirty, messy types of technology. And to find that even for a Luddite such as myself, that is technology. Um, I think it's pretty funny that I am now uh, the director of a festival of art and technology. Um, my charge there really has been to not only create space for amazing artists like the folks that you see here on the panel who truly are working um, at some of the most cutting edge technology forms, but also to kind of bring up the rear and help other people like me find those technologies that they most um, associate with. Or, you know, again, I think on our kind of prep call for this meeting, somebody said, yeah, you know, a, a paintbrush is a technology. Um, so we certainly have done some very high tech projects with, um, 3D modeling, laser cuddling, laser cuddling, laser, laser cuddling, laser cutting, computer modeling. Um, Tesla Orchestra is, you know, one of the many residents in our space. Uh, you have projection work here um, uh, pictured. And yeah, I don't know why this is coming out so low res, but um, pictured with Morris and Dance Company, who I know has collaborated with uh, a number of our other panelists. Um, they are belaying off the ceiling, uh, belaying off the wall here, hanging from the ceiling. You know, there's technology in figuring out how to rig them up and how to mount this platform. Um, you can't really see they're, they're hanging about 30 feet from the ceiling. Um, there's technology in trying to figure out how to calculate the correct curve of our 30 foot rocking boat so that we're not accidentally having too much fun and launching people, you know, uh, into the air. Um, there is um, technology in figuring out how to make our um, people-powered hot air balloon rock. but as well as making sure that folks all understand that technology is and should be accessible. And that um, I think the rest of our conversation will really talk about how do you marry um, art that you have in your head or your heart with the appropriate technology that you need um, to create your concept and design. And I know a big piece of that as you guys look towards the opportunities um, that Nicole and Heather are, you know, bringing up for discussion today. It's it's not about necessarily the most cutting edge technology. It's about the technology that serves your purpose and is right for you. Thanks so much, Emily, and thanks for all of you guys to uh, for 
sharing a little bit more about your work, helping to set the stage um, for this discussion Ooh, about I need art to do this and technology. And... So um, I thought we could start off by um, you guys responding to what have been some of the hesitations about incorporating technology into your art. And um, it's a twofold question, that and um, what type of advice would you give an artist who is looking to do more of that? So feel free to answer you know, both of those or whichever makes sense for you. Hmm. If I can start with that one. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I find for myself is you know, it always goes back to the experience. You know, um, again, I'm thinking more on the live performance aspect, uh, thinking about um, not only from the performer point of view, but it's also from the, the, the audience or the viewer point of view. And so when I think about the different kind of technology, you know, you, the question of hesitance is, is this the right one? Is this, you know, how is this helping us move forward? How does this help the art? How does this help my work? Um, and that's the thing that that often haunts me a little bit. Is this the right thing? Is this the right one? Um, am I just as and again, you know, as has been shared before, it's like, you know, I always think, you know, the, the technology should be supporting the artwork and not the art being as a means to sort of showcase the technology. And I have to keep, you know, it's like that question I've had in my head for the past 20 some odd years. You know, it's I, I keep coming back to that as a sort of like a self check. So back to your question as to the hesitancy, it always goes back to that. It's like, you know, before I plunge myself in, I really do some thoughtful um, reflection on that uh, before I really dive in. But once I've gotten through that from an aesthetic uh, point of view, then I can invest in. I mean, the other, uh, one of my hesitancies is given that this technology will help me fulfill my mission in creating a certain piece the expense because let's face it you know computers are expensive if i could get a quantum computer right now i'd get it you know because that would be that would really help me a lot but that's probably in the you know half billion dollar range so you know it that also has you know and the accessibility you know, some people don't have computers or they don't have the, the tools they need. So start small and just practice, you know, perfect what you have and grow from there. It's my two cents. That's really great advice. Did anyone else, um, any of the other panelists want to chime in on that? Great. Um, what types of, talk a little bit about maybe some of the knowledge gaps or um, kind of hurdles working working with technology and how you've been able to overcome them. Practice, 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 period. You know, when I taught at uh, Cleveland Institute of Art, um, I helped found the, um, the first technology major that we, that they had. Um, and I found that students who had had been had uh, known an instrument, you know, were, were performers or you know played the piano or something like that, they were they learned technology better because they were used to practicing, and that's the I think that's the key. Focus on something small and accessible, and learn it and practice it, and then start doing variations of that task and then that i think that's how to grow in this field you have to be fearless exactly that's what we were thinking yeah. you have to be truly fearless because you are making this technology work for you yeah so you have to push the technology to its limits pretty much constantly mm -hmm. and therefore that technology will break multiple times a day so um so you have to be fearless. I think that's that's really quite important. Fearless and a lifelong learner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I also think from you know you're talking about the, uh, the the knowledge gap and all that, and that's where I find. I mean, there's, I mean, I don't. There's several technologies that I've I've integrated, and it's like I don't know this stuff. 
you know, but part of it is like, you know, that that's part of the creative process is learning it. And then it changes, you know, it sort of infl it informs your, pro your creative process and in, in doing so. So it's like all the things that have been shared on the subject, I would add on to that. You know, the idea of it also changes or informs your thinking. But back to the knowledge gap, I think that's where the role of fabulous collaborators being kind of, you know, they could be the, the, the most unexpected collaborator or would they've got an amazing skill set and like a you know, like out of left field, but somehow it makes complete sense. You know, and you're just like it's a beautiful combination of things. Or they bring to the table um, a certain kind of expertise. And you know, in that also informs the practice as well, too. So though there are these gaps that can occur, they shouldn't be obstacles all the time because you know there's ways to get to it. And I find for myself that sometimes it's you know, who I'm working with and my collaborators. And um, I have the benefit, like many of the other panelists here have been doing it long enough, you build a track record. So when you come up with some ridiculous harebrained idea, people don't stare at you like, you know, you're nuts. Well, they'll do that anyways, but they'll believe you. So that's half the battle. And I, I see a comment. How did the panelists get around the monetary hurdle? Um, again, start small, you know, and build and build a reputation and, and get good at your craft. And then people will want to, you know, pay you to do these things and apply for grants. I mean, that's, I mean, that's how shockwaves got done. I mean, I, a lot of my work is grant based. So that's another and, you know, another uh, another part of my kind of learning toolkit since I didn't go to school was um, this is also, I guess, about starting about 20 years ago, I was doing videos for nonprofit organizations, you know, just doing sort of run of the mill industrial kind of work. Um, and I got my chops that way. I mean, I learned the tools by doing you know, not mundane, but, you know, useful, useful work. Um, and right along the same time I started doing that, I, I got to work with Gary. And we just, you know, it just sort of exploded from there. So get your chops in a conventional way and learn and, learn and get really good at what you're doing. And then you, people will want to give you money to do projects, you know, to pay for the projects. Join a makerspace, find collaborators, volunteer if you can. A number of great makerspaces are uh, kind of in and amongst the, the folks that you're talking to here. Um, make use of the technology of the internet. I mean, it's there now. There's no putting back in the box what's going on with YouTube tutorials, with Etsy, with um, you know Reddits on certain topics. There's so, so, so much specialized knowledge out there. Um, everyone's already said it, but starting small, um, it's, it's not just, uh, about building your chops and it's not even just about the monetary hurdle. It is also about teeing yourself up for a number of great sm small successes, you know, pushing the technology to the edge was, was mentioned, but that can still be in a achievable way where you are able to scale up, gain mastery, again, all the things that everyone else has said, um, but give yourself a realistic goal so that you can achieve it so you don't get discouraged, um, you know, and, and props again to the kind of like do real work, right? Everybody who is an artist who is successful as an artist um, has done some things that don't look like their artistic practice and it gives them so much depth and breadth and work ethic and everything else. And yes, I mean, absolutely, you should be paid for your art, um, but you should have other real world experiences that bolster and add to it. A few things were kind of touched on, but I'd like to maybe dig a little bit deeper. Are there other maybe kind of like unexpected resources or partners or venues that, you know, artists can be thinking about that maybe aren't typically in like kind of the fine art sphere that would be relevant or helpful for an artist who's interested in tech? The theater, you know, theater productions at all scales, whether it is you know, local community theaters and high and high school theaters increasingly have really beautifully equipped shops, um, and they always need help. Yeah. 
I would add to that that I mean, though my perhaps my uh, my resource bin is um, different because you know I, I don't have to. Um, in that being at a research university, they have a lot of the toys. So, but the thing is, is that you don't realize, uh, you know, that oh, I can go over here. It's like I'm working on drum up you know some ideas but you never think about it unless you go out and start looking around it's like not that it's free shopping but it's like you know these things are at least for me you know it, it allows me to start thinking differently when i realize all the stuff that's around me and so but i didn't know it and so part of that is just engaging with others even though they may not be artists they may be technologists they may be somebody in engineering they may be somebody in physics you know, and so you, you'd be really surprised. It's like you wouldn't expect something. And all of a sudden you, you look at something where you think, oh, wait a second, you know, I can do something like this, so I can make use. It's just a scale question because I'm gonna take it from this small thing. I need to make it ridiculously huge, <clears throat> you know, that's, but it's, you know, the pieces are there. And so it stimulates ideas, but it just, it came out of somebody's lab. <laughs> so you never know where it's gonna come from. I mean, the other thing is I, I think, meeting people, talking to people, you never know who you're going to meet. I mean, I've, I've done stuff at NASA using this, it's a cave technology, it's configurable something, something, something. It's three dimensional. I mean, it's, it's the precursor to augmented reality, actually. And just by chance, I was able to do this just by meeting people and talking to people. They say, oh, what do you do? And I, you know, so get out there and just meet people, talk to people. Mm -hmm. and, and see the work too, because the then work, you, know, yeah. you realize, oh, wait a second, you know, and I don't know about, you know, some of the other panelists here, but, you know, when in my environment, it's easy to get, you know, siloed. And so, you know, you realize you're just sort of, st I'm stuck under my rock. And occasionally yeah. you need to come above ground and, you know, and uh, you know, look at the sun again and go see some of the other work then all of a sudden it's like oh wait a second <laughs> you know and then it just sort of spins off some thoughts so that exposure piece be it through dialogue conversations seeing the work those kinds of things um, can be helpful and there are maker space directories online hacker space directories online um, get to your maker fairs get to trade shows to the degree that you can find those that are public certainly art exhibitions um, you guys have a great resource in Bounce Innovation Hub. Um, I'm sure you guys partner with them all the time. Um, Thinkbox, you know, plug for Thinkbox at um, at Case Western. It is an you know an amazing resource to the uh, Gary's point about being at a research university with all the toys. It's it's open to the public. Um, yes, yes, it is, and there's a lot of toys. <laughs> Yeah, the, one of the here's the uh, question about after we have our aha moment of coming up with the concept, how do you go about finding and researching the tools? Well, going online and all right, how to or what if or what to this is actually something that you can use Ch Chat GTP for. Or what are the tools I can use for? such and such. And it will sort of, I mean, chat GTP is still a compilation of the internet. I mean, it's it's what's out there, but it will help compile information for you and feed it back. You you just never know. You, I mean, this is why the internet is horrible and great at the same time, that you can, it, it knows everything. You know, we can find everything on, online. You just have to know the questions to ask. And see you. Okay, I'm I'm reading the messages here. Um, so we have we've talked about maybe some of the challenges and pitfalls, but in what ways has technology revolutionized your work? In what ways has it maybe helped engage audiences? <laughs> well, I think I mean I will say this that um, you know I'm thinking back to that early project, one of the early projects that Kasumi and I did, um, you know, it's, you know, that we were working on these transcontinental artworks and things this sort. 
And, you know, it's funny because at the time, you know, in my field and dance, it's, you know, it's a time space art. And here we were integrating a technology that the concept of space was getting a little twisted, you know, and then later on when we, we then branched this into um, a, a three city kind of idea. You know, I remember turning to one of my graduate students and I just said, where in the hell does this dance take place? Because it's like, you know, this idea of, you know, we're so used to cramming these dances on these little, you know, these little black boxes called stages and whatnot, but now we're changing that idea. So we have these, cent you know, these several uh, central tenets of our art form, but the technology is sort of causing us to rethink some of that. And I, in that rethinking, it now sort of opens up some new opportunities and some new thinking as a result of that. So that's certainly one thing I've, in, I've encountered. And especially then when I have these latter works with some of the holographic work, being able to put holograms on stage, you know, three-dimensional kinds of things. It's like, you know, this, the idea that using image as part of our communication stream uh, and part of our palette of our art form and how we communicate in this art form, you know, that just opens up a whole new realm of things. And, and do you realize how cheap it is to make a, a set out of light? You know, it's like super easy. You don't have to construct it anymore. You know, it's like, but it's kind of like this kind of weird idea. It's like, oh, well that, you know, that makes it, you know, different. So again, it's sort of challenging these time-honored ideas of our art form. And it's really helping to sort of set the stage for the, the next generation of ideas. So I share that. Yeah, and, and sort of as a piggyback on that, I mean, taking the work out of a white cube, out of a black cube, I think it's just really, really important, you know, and be that sort of a festival, be that that you actually sort of organize something for your local community, or even as far as like, just put it in nature, right? So so it was, for, for part of our work, it became sort of important to have a dialogue with a completely new audience, not just with this sort of, privileged audience that goes to to a gallery and then so that was quite important to us so think not only oh how can this fit into a preset stage um but how can you actually push uh the limits of your venue and i think even the last piece of it is uh Kasumi, i think you said the 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 wonderfulness and horror of the internet right you know in in the past i mean the really really rapid pace at which people are sharing ideas and collaborating pushing technologies forward um you can't sleep too long uh lest you find out somebody else has already done the cool thing that you thought of last week um it's you know it's kind of horrifying to come up with a brilliant idea and google it and find out that somebody has always already done it um but at the same time it does help push the technology forward push you know it pushes each of us as individuals forward um helps us to build and iterate and and even collaborate um you know as we've said well i also think too is that the, you know the speed of development is key here because you know Another thing that I realized is like, you know, I'm, I keep talking, referring to Kasumi because she and I go back so far, but, you know, going back to that transcontinental work, it's like, you know, it's to think about at the time it was revolutionary. And now the fact that we've got all these people on a Zoom, it's like, you know, if we were to try and do that thing, it looks so old, you know, but, you know, the, the fact that these, it, but this happened, this happened in the course of 20 years. It's like, you know, um, because of, like, I found it really interesting is that it, when we ran into COVID and all these artists and all these, especially the performing arts, they're trying to figure out how to salvage their seasons. They're trying to salvage or create performing opportunities. They all like, you know, flock to Zoom and it's like, oh my God, if I watch one more Zoom dance, you know, and it's like, I, you know, we, you know, consuming I did this 20 years ago. I don't want to do that. I already did that. You know, I want to do something different, but it, it, the point being is that it's, you know, it, it can move so fast. And that's another thing I found you know, very interesting is just because you get into something, you realize how quickly it, it moves, you know, um, and develops. So it's, as you said, um, Emily, it's like, you know, you don't want to sleep because you don't, you don't lose an idea, it'll get old <laughs> overnight. <laughs> Thank you.
So I think we have time for probably one uh, last quick question to end things. Um, what are you guys, what new technology, um, upcoming technology are you guys excited about? Well, I just, I am playing with um, motion capture and AI. I j literally just, just tried it and it's like, it's very much fun. I don't know if, if it will fulfill any great artistic need of mine, but it was a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, motion capture is sort of an older technology, but applying that data to other technologies is kind of exciting. And I think I, you know, there's something to that in that sometimes it's not just one technology, it's when you put different technologies together. You know, and that's so it's not the single thing. It's like you start creating suites of of technology and that type of thing here. I think that's that that's gonna be very interesting. I like for example, one of the things I'm thinking about is some of the new generation of visualization and then combining that with some of you know, the, the sensing and technology, but then the visualization technology. So I'm thinking in those realms as well, too. It's like putting these ideas together type of thing. It's like, because you know you do this thing and this one and this one and this one. So for example, um, holographic work with LIDAR and dance. Yeah. Now our case, it's more like material research. I think um, new materials that are available to us be either biomaterials or polymers, you know, hydrophilic, or it's sort of just materials that can push the realm that we weren't necessarily able to access within the last, you know, few months and years. And I think within that research, um, I think there's a lot of uh, potential and possibilities. And it's not just us as artists, but there's a ton of engineers and scientists behind it. And so I think that's the most exciting process. Yeah. Us, new materials. I think for me, uh, it's a little bit of column A and a little bit of column B. I think, you know, there's a lot of fear and anxiety right now about how AI is going to impact artists and creatives. Um, I am excited to see how people kind of push through that and some of the solutions that come out of it and sort of that reaffirmation of what is the value of a human creative mind. Um, I don't have the answer, but I think we're going to see some really interesting uh, folks grappling with that problem. So I'm, I'm interested by that. And then certainly um, on the other uh, side of things, um, you know, really interested in material science and especially um, kind of some of the different biomimicry type sustainable materials that are becoming more readily available for the consumer um, as they are used in industrial processes, manufacturing processes, et cetera. And I think um, now as we're through uh, with the pandemic, there's kind of a redoubling down on some of that becoming available. Um, so excited to see what sort of new manufacturing brings us. Great. Well, I think that is a wrap for this evening. Uh, thank you so much again, uh, Gary, Emma uh, Emily, Marcus, Margarita, and Kasumi for joining this, uh, joining us this evening. Um, I think that they've given some really great things to think about and examples um, for hopefully everyone in the audience to how they might be able to take some next steps with technology. I'm going to put in the chat again um, the link to the other workshops coming up on July 20, uh, 27th. Heather and I will be talking about uh, your technology toolkit from kind of an entrepreneurial uh, business element of being an artist and how, uh, you know, what platforms are out there to kind of support um, those elements of being an artist. So thank you again, everyone, and have a great night. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Everyone, have a wonderful evening. You too. Too.